Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Be welcome to the Euro Cities um, meeting group. We will talk about um, the rent control measures in cities. And uh, our objective of the session is to discuss various tools used by cities to mitigate negative phenomena associated with high degree of speculation and in housing markets in Europe. Uh, my name is Tonet Font. I am a social innovation assessor for the Council of Barcelona. And I'm pleased to introduce Ms. Susan Bauer, Chair of Working Group Housing of uh, the City of Vienna. Thank you. Hello. Um, my name is Susanne Bauer. I'm the Chair of EuroCities Working Group Housing. And I warmly like to welcome you to this session on rent stabilization measures in cities, especially in growing cities like in Barcelona, London or Bonn. We are discussing different instruments of how to control costs of rent in their cities. These initiatives are becoming more and more important due to the lack of affordable housing in many big European cities. Furthermore, many European cities are suffering from stagnating incomes. People do not earn more, sometimes they earn less. We are at the same time, we are confronted with market, markets which increasingly also fail to provide affordable housing to households that would not directly be labeled as disadvantaged citizens or socially disadvantaged groups. That means I am talking of small and middle incomes, large families, young families and households or older people that are facing severe problems in finding affordable housing. Some of them have to pay more than 40% of their income for housing normally it should, not be, it should be about 25% and not more. To sum up, broad levels of society have to cope with inequality and housing exclusion or poor housing conditions. We know that cities try to provide structures where social and affordable housing can take place. Public authorities have to be able to create affordable living space. So, we are really looking forward what the City of Barcelona, the Greater London Authority and the City of Bonn is doing in the sector of rent control measures. We are looking forward to your initiatives and hope to learn from your best practice. Thanks very much for listening and I'm looking forward to an interesting session. Thank you very much, Susanna. Now, Agatha Kraus, uh, Policy Advisor for EuroCities, will introduce the uh, subjects. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Agatha Kraus, and I'm Policy Advisor on Housing for the EuroCities. EuroCities is a network that associates major European cities. We are talking about the cities of 250,000 inhabitants above, and my network associates 60% of them. We have working group housing. Suzanne introduced our working group already, and today we are gathering here to discuss two very important subjects. The first is rent stabilization measures in cities, so indeed how to embrace speculation in housing markets in European cities. The second, uh, second um, subject that will be discussed tomorrow is about changing modes of housing governance in cities. What kind of new actors on housing markets appear in cities and how do they shape dynamics in housing provision in cities? How do they interact with local authorities? What are the benefits of working with them in cities? So it's a very, very interesting and up-to-date topic. So as Suzanne mentioned, we will have um, 
three presentations today from this city uh, administration and one introduction from the house, housing councillor of Barcelona municipality. And I'm indeed very much looking forward to discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Agata. Now we will listen to our housing councillor of uh, Barcelona, Josep Maria Montaner, who will guide us, uh, explaining us if, uh, how, how we are dealing with uh, the raising pressures on housing markets in the city. Uh, good morning. Welcome to people that arrived to Barcelona to participate in Smart City Congress. Uh, I will give my lecture in Spanish because there is a translation and, and it's uh, more easy to explain in, in uh, Spanish words. Uh, lo que voy a explicar brevemente es cómo afronta la ciudad de Barcelona en su, digamos, en su contexto, en la crisis de vivienda y emergencia de vivienda y dentro del contexto legal, digamos, del... del el gobierno autónomo catalán y del Estado español. Vamos a ver brevemente algunas cuestiones clave de los instrumentos que estamos utilizando. Si no se ve mucho la imagen, bueno, sí se ve. Uh, junto al título hay una imagen que nos, nos sirve para recordar esencialmente dos cuestiones de partida. Una, digamos, que el, todo el la mecánica, ¿no? toda la maquinaria de la Smart City, su, amplísima, es una maquinaria que cada vez va evolucionando más hacia los derechos, hacia que la información y toda una serie de facilidades se utilicen para uh, organizar mucho mejor las ciudades, pero no solamente para organizarlas, la maquinaria urbana, sino para que todo este organismo urbano y metropolitano alcance lo, logros por lo que respecta a la igualdad y a la justicia. La ciudad de Barcelona está en este sentido de cambio, de transformación hacia una Smart City en este sentido social. Esta era una primera cuestión. La segunda cuestión es que siempre que trabajamos en esta escala de la Smart City, de la información, nos lleva a la escala territorial, nos lleva a trabajar, digamos, sin fronteras municipales, nos lleva a trabajar a la escala del territorio y a la escala de unas informaciones que no pueden cortarse en unas fronteras, digamos, de términos municipales, sino que nos llevan a esta gran escala. Esto sería la primera cuestión para tener en cuenta y luego, aunque sea rápidamente, toda una serie de datos para situarnos, que aquí podéis ver, los, los millones de habitantes de la ciudad y del área metropolitana que doblaría la población, un área metropolitana que tiene una constitución urbana similar a la de Barcelona, similar sobre todo a la de los barrios más populares de Barcelona, Barcelona tendría como excepción una, un centro histórico y un ensanche que sería en la parte simbólica de la ciudad. Una ciudad en la cual se ha pasado por la terrible experiencia, por el drama de las ejecuciones hipotecarias, de la cual aún estamos viendo las consecuencias humanas, sociales, urbanas, y que en este momento está sufriendo otra, otra de alguna manera, vulnerabilidad de la ciudad, como se sabe que se produce en muchas ciudades de esta economía global, que es la invasión, digamos, de los fondos de inversión. Esto está provocando, junto a, otras, a otros factores que podemos analizar más adelante, está ocasionando un incremento de los precios de alquiler y, al mismo tiempo, por lo tanto, procesos de, de, de expulsión de los vecinos porque no pueden alcanzar el pago de los alquileres que van subiendo y también de ejecuciones, en este caso de pérdida de la vivienda, por no poder pagar el alquiler. Este, digamos, es el contexto en el que estamos. Es clarísimo esta, esta, este, esta, este diagrama, nos muestra realmente cómo ha evolucionado el precio del alquiler de 6 euros el metro cuadrado antes de la burbuja inmobiliaria hasta el doble, 12 euros el metro cuadrado, como bajó relativamente, tampoco mucho, relativamente a, 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 a 10 a, euros el metro cuadrado y ha subido en este momento ya por encima, casi 13 euros, por encima del precio que tenía en el momento más alto de la burbuja inmobiliaria. Esto se produce, digamos, además, en el caso del Estado español, por la crisis laboral, por la situación de España, 
por la, el, agudizarse las diferencias sociales en un contexto en el cual las clases populares, clases medias y clases populares, sus ingresos están disminuyendo. Los ingresos no solo no crecen, no solo no se mantienen, sino que está disminuyendo la media de los ingresos por familia o por persona, lo cual ocasiona, digamos, esta, esta separación, esta dificultad para que el mercado del alquiler, que en Barcelona es una tercera parte, el 31%, pueda de alguna manera adoptar, desarrollar proyectos de vida con una cierta continuidad y con una cierta seguridad. Uh, hay este concepto sobre el que estamos trabajando, uh, que es este del, el sobreesfuerzo uh, económico familiar, esta relación entre el coste de la renta de alquiler y los ingresos de las personas, unidades de convivencia y familias. En este momento podemos adelantar, bueno, que es una cifra que ya se utiliza, que el, el, casi el 40% de los alquileres en Barcelona, las familias, unidades de convivencia, están pagando el 40% o más de su, de su renta. Están dedicando casi la mitad de su renta a pagar el alquiler en una parte importante, en, este, en un 40% que serían los que no tienen alquileres uh, permanentes o alquileres por ciertos años. Por lo tanto, estamos en este contexto, pero los factores son muchos. Uh, hay estos factores de la economía global, de este exceso de capital que se invierte en las ciudades y que está invirtiendo en, en comprar edificios, en comprar viviendas, además de otros uh, activos inmobiliarios en la ciudad, pero que están comprando las ciudades con todo su carácter, su vida barrial, toda su, la herencia de las ciudades. Pero al mismo tiempo hay, hay otros condicionantes. En el caso de Barcelona, como se sabe, otro de los factores está siendo la industria turística, la expulsión de vecinos y vecinas a construirse nuevos hoteles. Esto lo hemos detenido en Barcelona de manera, creemos, modélica, con un plan especial de alojamientos urbanísticos, de alojamientos uh, turísticos, uh, que es, ya se toma como referencia que está transformando toda, de, de alguna manera, la distribución territorial de los hoteles en Barcelona y también el fenómeno de los apartamentos turísticos, legalizados en una parte y uh, con la lucha que estamos manteniendo con bastante éxito contra los alojamientos turísticos ilegales. Este es otro factor. Pero también hay otro factor coyuntural que se da en muchos países y especialmente se da en España, que la política y la normativa estatal van totalmente a favor de los inversores, de las, las socimis, fondos inversores, fondos buitres, etcétera, a las que les dan todas las facilidades y beneficios. Esto ya empezó en la, eh, tímidamente en la época del gobierno socialista y se ha in, eh, impuesto de manera drástica en el gobierno eh, conservador contemporáneo de, de, del Partido Popular. No solo esto, digamos, la ley de arrendamientos urbanos se cambió en el 2013, reduciendo el alquil, la temporalidad mínima de cinco a tres años, con lo cual esta, esta proyección de, de, de invertir en la vivienda se disminuye, la vivienda, por lo tanto, se convierte en un elemento continuo de cambio, de inversión, y no en algo que tiene que ver con el derecho a, a, a la vivienda, a vivir, a una calidad de vida en el espacio doméstico. Y no solo esto, sino que el, el nuevo plan estatal es un plan que solo propone ayudas, no plantea ningún cambio estructural en absoluto, cuando eh, lo que se, se ha de hacer y estamos haciendo en Barcelona es un cambio estructural de política de vivienda. Y además también es evidente la drástica reducción de inversión, que de más, mil, más de 1.500 millones de euros en el año 2009 se ha reducido en este año en que la crisis aumenta, la crisis de vivienda, en 467, muy poco por encima de lo que dedica la Generalitat de Cataluña o el Ayuntamiento de Barcelona. Y hay otro factor, lógicamente no hay un único factor, no solamente son los fondos de inversión, no solamente es una, unos estados que se dedican solo a, re, a intentar defender una pretendida unidad uh, que nunca ha existido, uh, no solo se, se dedican a favorecer a los inversores, a darles todas las facilidades, incluso a los grandes, a, a los que compran edificios de lujo con la Golden Visa, sin, sino que rescatan a los bancos y dejan, abandonan a la ciudadanía. No solo es el, el factor del turismo, no solo es el factor de las personas que vienen a vivir a Barcelona y tienen estudiantes, técnicos, profesionales que tienen ingresos mayores, sueldos a veces europeos, eh, por lo tanto muy por encima de los sueldos españoles o barceloneses y que en el mercado de alquiler de vivienda tienen ventaja. No solo es eso, sino es que además 
No, te, no hemos tenido en España, como sucede en los países mediterráneos, una política de vivienda continuada que haya creado un stock, un parque de vivienda pública suficiente. No llegamos al 2%, un 1,7% de parque de vivienda pública, con lo cual estamos totalmente en desventaja con otras ciudades o países, como Viena, en Austria, las ciudades holandesas, las ciudades francesas, que sí que tienen un 20, un 25, un 30, un 40% de vivienda pública, con lo cual... Es, hay más instrumentos para frenar esta, de alguna manera, invasión de los fondos de inversión en, en las grandes ciudades. Bien, esta es un, un poco la situación, el marco, qué es lo que estamos haciendo, lógicamente utilizando todas las medidas posibles, todos los recursos que podemos tener, económicos, humanos y sobre todo de, de método, de instrumento, Empezando por haber sensibilizado en relación al derecho a la vivienda, esto es algo que también es, morir de éxito implica las colas, el, el colapso en nuestras oficinas de vivienda, que tenemos imágenes de las oficinas de, la, de vivienda que hay en cada uno de los 10 distritos de Barcelona y también hemos, lógicamente, sensibilizado en torno a este derecho a la vivienda con todo tipo de actividades como estas jornadas. Y hemos aprobado a principios del 2017 un plan por el derecho a la vivienda que cubre 10 años para producirse este cambio estructural, este cambio de paradigma, de mentalidad, en que la administración pública, en este caso una ciudad que tiene sus límites, como Barcelona, se implica en una política de vivienda que tenga una continuidad y que atienda sobre todo a cuatro grandes ejes estratégicos. Prevenir y atender la emergencia habitacional y la exclusión residencial, que es, tiene que ver con, los de, con derechos sociales y, y, y que re, uh, de alguna manera requiere una gran inversión, ayudas y ayuda social, y disponer también de un stock de vivienda para realojar, cosa que uh, tenemos en una muy pequeña cantidad. Garantizar el buen uso de la vivienda, es decir, algo que también se da en todas las ciudades, en distintos grados y escala y por distintas razones. También hay muchas viviendas vacías en Barcelona, no tantas como parece, pero sigue habiendo viviendas vacías, muchas veces en muy malas condiciones. Por lo tanto, es necesario que las viviendas que están vacías tengan, pasan a tener un uso social. Lo deseable sería que fuera un alquiler asequible y aquellas que están en muy mal estado, la infravivienda, etc., pasen a ser uh, rehabilitadas. El, el eje clásico, que es el C, que sería ampliar el parque de vivienda, en ello estamos trabajando, pero es, significa que una maquinaria que ha ido siempre lenta y que ha, sido, ha hecho calidad, pero nunca una producción cuantitativa de vivienda, como es la del Patronat Municipal de la Vivienda, ahora será el Instituto Municipal de la, de la Habitat y la Restauración de Barcelona, pase de hacer cinco o seis proyectos en un momento a hacer 50 o 60, como está en este momento arrancando. Y luego, también muy importante, mantener, rehabilitar y mejorar el parque actual. Aquí también es un, una situación clave, porque la rehabilitación, que es clave porque es el, el, el elemento esencial para mejorar la calidad de vida en unas ciudades que ya están hechas, en las cuales la mayor parte de las personas viven en edificios que tienen 50, 100, 200 años, pero aquí hay uno de los peligros más importantes de gentrificación, es precisamente en la rehabilitación, en la transformación de las viviendas, donde hoy en Barcelona y en otras ciudades, se están produciendo procesos de acoso inmobiliario, de expulsión de vecindario, aprovechando este proceso de transformación de la vivienda. Por lo tanto, es un punto sobre el que hemos colocado un foco de atención, de aviso fuertísimo desde nuestro trabajo contra la gentrificación. A las ayudas al alquiler, aquí de nuevo veis estos gráficos que explican clarísimamente cómo las ayudas al alquiler, que en un cierto momento fueron necesarias, al, al, en esta onda de la crisis inmobiliaria y de las ejecuciones hipotecarias, bajó en el 2013 y el 2014 a la mitad. Hemos vuelto a incrementar y a intentar consolidar estas ayudas que se acercan a los 10 millones de euros para pagar las diferencias que no pueden pagar las familias, las unidades de convivencia, para pagar el alquiler, que acostumbra a ser una media más o menos de unos 200 euros que se dan durante un año para poder pagar el alquiler y que estas personas no sean expulsadas de sus viviendas, por lo tanto, para detener este, este proceso de alguna manera de gentrificación y de expulsión de vecindario. Lo que estamos haciendo también es un censo de viviendas vacías, para eso también tanto sumar la Smart City y todos los instrumentos de los datos, pero al mismo tiempo con esto no es suficiente. Cruzando todos los datos de 
que no hay consumo de agua, que no hay nadie empadronado, etc. Esto no implica, digamos, toda la información, los datos, no implican una veracidad 100%. Se ha de confirmar, aquí hay todo un mecanismo, veremos otra imagen, se ha de confirmar yendo haciendo visitas piso por piso, porque hay viviendas que están, se utilizan aunque nadie esté empadronado y aunque no haya consumos, consumos de alguna manera legales. Por lo tanto, es todo un proceso de tener los datos, a partir de estos datos confirmar que estas viviendas están vacías, cuando se confirma, se hace este censo, hay toda una fase al final con todos los datos para identificar a los propietarios, esto es algo que también cuesta que la opinión pública lo entienda. Muchas veces hay detrás bancos, inmobiliarias, fondos de inversión y no es tan fácil localizar en muchas ocasiones quién es realmente responsable de una vivienda vacía. Bueno, esto digamos, es toda una casuística realmente compleja y que es bueno, difícil de imaginar, pues es así, realmente este es otro cambio importante que se está produciendo en la ciudad de Barcelona. Los antiguos propietarios, la antigua burguesía ya se vendió sus fábricas, ahora se están vendiendo sus viviendas y a través también de los, de los administradores de finca, inmobiliarias locales, pero son, los capitales son capitales internacionales, finlandeses, israelitas, ingleses, etc. Y es muy difícil porque además estos capitales tienen detrás centenares de inversores con sus fondos de jubilación, etc. Cuando se, se detectan estos propietarios, especialmente los pequeños propietarios, lo que se hace es ofrecerles enormes ventajas para que entre en la vivienda asequible barcelonesa. Aquí vemos la, cómo se hace este censo de viviendas, cómo se toman los datos, pero al mismo tiempo se comprueban en, en la realidad y cómo todos estos datos tienen, se basan en un background que hemos creado, que se presentará ma, a mañana miércoles a las tres y media en el Ágora, de aquí la, la exposición de la Smart City, que es el Observatorio Metropolitano de la Vivienda. Es la base para tener todos los datos sobre propiedad, alquiler, precios, etcétera, etcétera, rentas. Todos estos datos los centrará, y datos metropolitanos, porque la única escala que existe es la escala metropolitana, y por esto este Observatorio de la Vivienda es un, una, un acuerdo entre Ayuntamiento, Área Metropolitana de Barcelona, Generalitat de Cataluña, Diputación de Barcelona y la GHS, que es, digamos, los que gestionan el, la vivienda social en Cataluña. A lo que hemos hecho, hemos conseguido unas mil viviendas en estos dos años, adquiridas, otras que están en trámite, otras que nos han cedido los bancos a cuentagotas y con enormes dificultades, más allá de los convenios que hicimos ya hace más de un año, esto suma a casi mil viviendas, Compram, hemos comprado 13 edificios, más alguno más, pero tres edificios con presupuesto de vivienda y algunos con otros presupuestos, para evitar la expulsión de los vecinos, utilizando el derecho de tanteo retracto, en los casos en que era evidente que iba a producirse un proceso de expulsión de los, de los vecinos. Y, lógicamente, estamos totalmente atentos a lo que nos dicen las Naciones Unidas, la relatora de la vivienda, Leilani Fara, o lo que ha escrito Raquel Rolnik, la anterior relatora, que nos explica toda la génesis de esta situación actual en que son los fondos de inversión a los grandes fondos de inversión, los que llevan la iniciativa por encima de los países y de los derechos humanos en la cuestión de la vivienda convertida en una mercancía y que está perdiendo su valor humano, su valor como derecho. Por lo tanto, luchar contra la financiarización de la vivienda es un objetivo, digamos, de toda plataforma o administración que, lo que, que intente defender el derecho a la vivienda. Tenemos también un convenio con el tercer sector, con Habitat 3, al que les, les hemos cedido 250 viviendas. Ellos añaden un valor cualitativo, que es el seguimiento social, el acompañamiento en estas viviendas, que también cedemos nosotros. Y esta, esta, esta campaña, tú tienes la llave, que ha servido para que se incremente la bolsa de alquiler accesible que había en cada uno de los distritos, con toda una serie de garantías y de ayudas económicas. Y también, lógicamente, estamos uh, incrementando, vamos a incrementar en 8.000 viviendas en este plan de vivienda, 8.000 viviendas nuevas uh, producidas por la Administración, más unas 8.000 producidas con otros operadores y agentes. Estos son algunos... De... Sí, ¿me quedan tres minutos? Vale. Uh, son algunos de los lugares donde tenemos suelo público para hacer vivienda, no, son, no están en, muchos, en los barrios más céntricos ni en los históricos, Aquí tenemos bueno, la, la, las inversiones en vivienda para hacer en, en un 80% alquiler asequible. Aquí tenemos el tanto por ciento de las tipologías, las construidas por el Instituto Municipal de Vivienda, las que se hacen con otros operadores sociales, fundaciones o el operador metropolitano o, entidad, o de alguna manera entidades sin ánimo de lucro. Uh, 
estamos a punto de crear un operador metropolitano, también de escala metropolitana, para el alquiler público-privado, que está, está ya en las últimas, últimas fases, y estamos promoviendo, aunque sea de, de manera aún casi testimonial, operaciones de cohousing, una versión del cohousing uh, tanto no, de la Europa del Norte como de Uruguay, adaptado a la ciudad de Barcelona, cediendo el suelo en uso, para uh, colectividades, promoviendo, por lo tanto, potenciando proyectos cooperativistas, proyectos de vida comunitaria, proyectos de ahorro energético, etcétera, en los cuales, de nuevo, la, la utilización de los datos de la informática son esenciales. Y, por último, las ayudas a la re rehabilitación. Aquí veamos de nuevo el, el esquema de las inversiones, que también es clarísimo. Uh, las inversiones en rehabilitación en todos los sentidos, desde barrios, edificios, hasta interiores de vivienda, Uh, en el año 2014 disminuyeron hasta el 3,7 millones de euros. En este año hemos, estamos invirtiendo 46,6 millones de euros en todo tipo de rehabilitación en la ciudad de Barcelona, pero con esta precaución de que sea una rehabilitación condicionada a que nunca implique ganancia, plusvalías y nunca implique expulsión de vecindario. Esto de, nos ha llevado a la situación en la que estamos, y ya termino, en la plataforma en la que estamos, en la que estamos sentando las bases para poder regular los alquileres, que es el objetivo que nos marcamos ya casi desde el principio del mandato y que la alcaldesa Dao Colau ya planteó uh, cuando llevábamos unos meses en, en, en el gobierno de Barcelona, todo el mundo se le echó encima, el sector inmobiliario, la administración central, etcétera, diciendo que esto era absurdo. ¿Cómo va a ser absurdo? Algo que en 1942 Roosevelt mismo promulgó cuando había la crisis de vivienda en Estados Unidos. Estados Unidos desde el año 42 tiene unas leyes de regulación de vivienda que han, que han ido, algunas desapareciendo, otras se han mantenido, se han, han reaparecido. Estados Unidos o Roosevelt, nada de alguna manera sospechosos de socialistas o, o, o de antisistema, ya en el 42 estableció un sistema de regulación de alquileres, como existe en París, tenemos aquí los representantes de Ambrosat, de, de, de una ciudad, en este caso modélica, en el, con todas las dificultades en el control de los alquileres, el encadrement de, de Loyer, o ciudades como Berlín. ¿Cómo no vamos a poder regular los alquileres? Pero hemos de tener este cambio de paradigma, hemos de tener un índice de precios que hemos conseguido ya que la Generalitat de Cataluña lo presentase en una web antes del verano, y, bueno, y terminamos con esto, digamos, nuestro objetivo es que no se produzca la gentrificación, que se mantenga la vida de los barrios, que se está manteniendo aún, los procesos de gentrificación son aún, aún porcentajes muy bajos, y aquí es el momento, antes del verano, en que las cuatro uh, entidades que forman este Observatorio Metropolitano de la Vivienda firmaban un acuerdo que sentaba las bases, precisamente, de tener un índice de precios y poder avanzar en una legislación uh, próxima que premie que fomente los alquileres dentro de este índice de precios y que sancione en aquellos casos de abuso de precios. Nada más, muchas gracias. Uh, thank you very much, José María, por explicarnos uh, why should cities intervene in housing, in housing markets and which tools uh, is Barcelona using. After the presentations, we will have we have reserved 45 minutes to talk about um, uh, how we can find a balance between intervening in housing markets and aiding housing market dynamics. Um, what factors should cities consider while intervening in housing markets? Who should be involved in designing such measures as rent ceilings and why? And what measures and actions are needed to further address the issue of raising pressures on housing markets? Anyway, if you have specific questions on uh, um, Julia Maria's presentation, we can answer to them now. No? Okay. So now I'm pleased to introduce you then the next three speakers, who are Mr. Rui Neves Bogman, Franco, Deputy City Councilor for Housing. Uh, Mr. Bernhard von Grunwerk from the Bonn City Council and Ms. Rona Brown from Private Rented Sector Program Manager, who is, sorry, the Private Rented Sector Program Manager from Great London Authority, which will give us more insights about other European experiences. Thank you. Yes, please. please come all uh, up and we can do it. Shall we do it from from the? We'll have to use this mic. Well, 
good morning to everybody. Thanks for the for the invitation of uh, of Eurocities. Um, I'm well. Just to start, I, I am sorry for the fact that I uh, I do not have a, a presentation uh, available. This is due to the fact that we just had uh, our elections in the Lisbon City Council uh, a couple of weeks ago, and and uh, and this policy has changed and is still uh, stabilizing. But uh, I I do commit to, to share this information still today with uh, with the organization so that it can be published. Anyway, uh, um, first I, I would. Uh, very much uh, like to, to thank the Barcelona uh, example. Uh, it is a reference for us. Uh, and the, the political group which I am part of, uh, uh, also a group of citizens that applied together for the, the elections in Lisbon 10 years ago. And we're still being holding, well, being needed to form the majority in Lisbon was formed around the platform on the right of housing. Um, the Portuguese constitution uh, defines the, the housing as a constitutional right. So the, uh, above any shared European national uh, interpretation on what, what should be private and what should be public, in Portugal the housing is a constitutional right and that is something that no law will, will be accepted by, uh, to change. Um, the city of Lisbon uh, is uh, within a metropolitan area of about the same size of, as Barcelona, so around 3 million people. But the, the city itself, uh, the administration, well, the, the, the city of Lisbon is, is quite smaller. And it has for 40 years been losing population. So uh, uh, in the 80s, we had uh, more than... Uh, 800,000 uh, inhabitants, and we are now facing the fact that we are in risk to get less than half a million uh, in the city, within a metropolitan and an economical area of 3 million, with all the, the environmental and social pressures that, uh, uh, that are easy to, to, to be imagined. Uh, what we understand is that the city should provide housing public or private, accessible for those who study and work there. So the, the concept of affordability comes to us in the, in the clear expression that a, 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 an average salary in Lisbon, a Lisbon salary, must cover within an affordable rate under 30%, like it was mentioned here, uh, the rents available. And this doesn't happen. Uh, in Lisbon, as in Barcelona, we are facing a huge growth in tourism. Uh, we are facing a, a growth of about 30% a year in tourism. Last year, we had more than 20 million visitors in the, in the city of Lisbon, a city with, with less than half a million. Uh, and what's happening is that the, the, the real estate uh, market is being defined by foreign uh, financial capability and not by uh, local uh, salaries and local uh, income. And so there is an, an outside pressure to create an inflation which is not natural and sustainable uh, to the local uh, economy and this is the, the core of the, of the, of the situation. Um, so Portugal and Lisbon in particular, uh, in the, especially in the 90s, we built uh, something like 20% of the, the housing stock in Lisbon for what we call social housing. And this is basically the, the, the poorest of the poor. Rents, houses which are rent on what we call the, a social rent, not cost-based, but income-based, uh, which so it is public housing owned by the city uh, and where the, the citizens can apply to, to, get, well, to, to get into the system. But most of them were delivered and about 20,000 house units of them were delivered in the 90s on the relocation of people that were then living in the, in the, in the slums that Lisbon had and now, and now it doesn't. Uh, but so there is a city w with 500,000 inhabitants where 
uh, more than 100,000 are the families that were living in the slum areas uh, uh, not much more than 20 years ago and were relocated to, to, to social housing where uh, uh, their rent is calculating, as I said, according to their income and never more than 12% of their, their income. So it is a dynamic renting system according to their income, updated every year. But where the city of Lisbon, just to, to give uh, some numbers, to, to, to some expression to what this means, covers the difference in maintenance and mortgage cost of the, of the building of these houses against what, they, what is charged as a, as a social rent of more than 100 million, million euros a year. Still, what we are facing now with a with with real estate uh, uh, change in Lisbon uh, is that we are basically losing or reaccelerating the loss of population because common uh, uh, working class cannot afford to live in Lisbon. Like the average salary in Portugal is about 800 euros, the minimum salary being less than 600. And uh, uh, it is virtually impossible to find a house for less than, uh, uh, to rent a house for less than 1,000 euros uh, a month in Lisbon. And to be even uh, well, clearer than that, there is basically no houses to be rent in the private sector. Uh, Politically and historically, there, there's a, a, a path of, of more than 50 years where, where private renting was, was uh, blocked by law, like that the, the rents could not go up. And so there is a huge cultural resistance to rent a, a property because of the risk of becoming uh, unprofitable in, in the short term. Of course, this system was killed. It doesn't, it doesn't exist anymore. But... Uh, uh, facing to an alternative of, instead of having like 5% uh, profit from renting a house on a, on a residential long-term contract, to do that on the, on the short term, where the, in Lisbon, on Airbnb and other platforms, the, the, the average income is around 40% a year, meaning that you, buy, you pay your, invest in, your investment, you cover your investment uh, in less than three years, uh, it has completely shifted the, 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 the real estate market. Uh, I've been sharing uh, my own experience, which, just to give a very clear example, uh, I bought a house less than three years ago, still in the city, but not in the center at all, like close to the airport. Uh, and a year ago, I was offered three times what, I, what I've paid for it. So this is the, the level of inflation on the real estate uh, market in Lisbon. So uh, we are basically addressing this with two different um, policies. One has already been tried in the last uh, uh, four to six years, which we called like the, so on top of the, the social rent, which covers 20% of the, of the stock, as I, as I was saying, so about 25,000 house units in Lisbon. We started, we the city started to, to rent houses by a uh, cost base, or so not with profit, but rents, well, around 300 euros for, to, to, have a, to put a, a number in the, in the speech, in the conversation. Uh, and, uh, and for people with, with basically limiting the, the ones who can apply for the, for the, for the ones who, can, who are already above the social, the social rent market, and those, well, the gap in the system, basically, the, 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 the middle class. Uh, and we've tried the system being owned and managed directly by the city council. We have already like less than, than 500 house, house units uh, being rented in, in this system uh, uh, created in the, in the last four years. But what we, we've understood is that the, the city, the public administration capacity to address the speeds and, uh, of, the, of this change in the market uh, is not compatible. We do it uh, solely public. So this new program that we call, like the, uh, in Portuguese, the, the, the affordable rent program, it is basically uh, uh, run with uh, municipal property, land and buildings in need of renovation. Uh, we are aiming to build, uh, uh, in the next 10 years, about 25,000 units, 
at least 7,000 in this next political term, which just started, so in the next uh, four years until, until uh, 21, until 2021. And the system is basically on top of something of uh, uh, doing as much as, as we can within the public administration. We are opening tenders, so uh, public procurement, for a concession to private investors where we basically uh, ensure or offer a system where they, they will get about 7% profit a year. Uh, they will build or renovate the, the, the municipal property, building houses which are predefined in a program. Uh, they will ex explore them, renting them within a platform which is public with predetermined prices by the city council, which is basically, just to have an idea, 200 for, uh, uh, for studios, 250 for one bedroom, 300 for two bedroom house units, uh, 350 for, for three bedroom house units, and, and four, 400 for, for four bedroom house units. And this, what we, we've proven, and, and some, some contracts have already been signed uh, uh, or as a result of the first competitions that, that, that happened during this last summer, is that if the management within these rents is not profitable enough, it is faster to build these dozens of thousands within this contract, where, as a, as a, where the city, to ensure that those 7%, Will 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 not get the property back of the whole of the whole system. So we're talking about the concession contract of of 30 years, where the, the property remains public, and the property of the housing comes back to the city council again after the concession. But in those cases, like renovation, where the construction costs are higher, we would give up to 25% uh, of the property for them to for the private investor to sell, in order to ensure 25,000 house units within this price range, to do it fast enough to, to resist to the, to the, to the pressure. Uh, and, and this is the, the side of the construction, of, of creating new offer that will uh, impact the, the, the market, but also give an immediate response to the, to the needs of the people working in Lisbon that cannot afford to live in Lisbon. Another subject which, which I was also asked to comment on, to comment is what we are doing with the, with the, with the, the, the short-term rentals platforms. And uh, we, until now, the power of licensing the, this system belonged to the national authorities and not to the, municip and not to the municipalities. So until now, we didn't have the, the power to change it. But we are just about to close a, a, a political negotiation with the government so that we would finally get the power to be us, the city, to define to give the, 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 the license or not to do, to do short term, and with a, with, a, with, a, with a political commitment of defining quotas per areas of the city, and the, 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 the novelty that we are bringing in the system is that to mandate, well, to, to oblige platforms to manage both long and short term uh, rentals, for them not to be allowed to charge more than, than the affordable rent to the long-term contracts and to per equate profit between all rentals, short and long, to all the, to all the, 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 the building owners by square meter and so per equate the huge amount of, well, the huge difference in profit between long and short term and so that they would all have an afford, an interesting uh, uh, profit more than 25% between the five and the 40, but to finance one with the other. And that's my contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rui. Uh, this has been really interesting. Do, do you have any specific questions on, the, on this presentation? No. OK, so we continue. Um, well, um, thank you very much, Rui, again, for giving us more insight on the housing market reality in the Southern European countries. The proposal sound very familiar, but now we change the geographical scope and move to the north and see how a, a, a northern city, the city of Bonn, is facing the rise of inequalities. Uh, Mr. Bernhard von Grunberg uh, will explain us. Thank you. Well, this is stick to make the next one, yes? 
Okay. My name is Bernhard von Grünberg. I come from the city of Bonn, and um, I was here several times because we helped to found uh, a tenants organization in Barcelona. So I am caring for housing politics since uh, yeah, some decades. Um, because for, I, I, my presentation is a little more juridic, what we do. Perhaps I will shorten it and you can send it. Uh, I think you send my, my uh, speech so you can see it a little bit uh, intensive more and so I can make it a little bit um, shorter. Um, first, I have to say that uh, we have different system of price reduction. First, we have the social housing, but in, for example, in my town, we have less than 10% of all housing uh, in, uh, in social houses. And we have more or six in my town, 70% of rented houses, not owned houses, rented houses, rented houses. And, um, but we have 50%, more than 50%, they could have a such social house, but we have only this small quarter. And in this rental house, it's this social house, we have a situation that uh, there is a fixed price starting with six euro 25 in Bonn. And uh, you have the possibility to grow it up every year 1.2%. So that's more or like less a fixation of prices. Secondly, we have this free market and we have a system of uh, prices which is um, yes, uh, average rent for compar comparable dwellings in the area. You know, that's a system we have and you can only have this money what is normal average prices. Um, so. Um, so you have to make a difference between rented houses, already rented houses, and new, uh, new houses. Normally, uh, the landlord is permitted to raise the uh, rent in only in this uh, average uh, rent. You have to say what is the average rent, and uh, then it's not only it's only possible to raise it in 20 percent every three years. And in special towns where there's a big need, uh, then it's only 50%. And, um, but in the system when you have a new arrangement, then you, can, you are free, mostly free to make a market price. But now we have a new law that means uh, it's, not al it's only allowed in this special area with uh, high demand it's only uh, allowed 10% over the, this market price, over this normal price. Um, and, um, but we have uh, difficulties with this new law because uh, if you go to court, for example, at the tenants and say, okay, he is more than 10% of this normal price, then uh, the landlord can say, okay, I had this high price already in the the, uh, the um, uh, tenants before and so uh, I can have this money because it, it's higher than normal but uh, you have to accept it. That's the reason why a lot of tenants don't go to court and ask for a reduction. So that's a discussion in the moment about this meat price bremse, perhaps you read it a little bit in newspaper about it. Um, Then we have a situation, sorry, we had another one, last one. Uh, then there are some other uh, limitations, 20% uh, over this normal regular price uh, that may, may be you can have a fine from, uh, from the government or from the town um, or 50% that even though that's a criminal uh, question, but this, both of these uh, questions are not so public because the town has to say that it's a shortage on this ma especially market and it's very difficult for the towns to say it's a shortage, uh, shortage of this market because you need 
Yeah, more information when you go to court uh, and then you have to mo give more information about this special market and the town. Normally, they have not the materials about the, uh, the situation in the uh, private market, so we don't have enough, uh, enough information about it. So it's very difficult. But we have this short 10%, 20%, and 50% with different, uh, different uh, solutions. Then we have another thing, when, when we modernize uh, apartment, there is a limitation of 11%, 11% of the uh, per annum of the cost of the modernization uh, I can give in a permanent basis. So that's a lot of money because uh, modernization is sometimes uh, 50,000 euro for an apartment and you can imagine what 11% means, 11% per year. And the uh, tenant can go, okay, that's uh, impossible to pay for my, I had to leave my apartment because I, uh, then I can, um, I have to leave my apartment. So if, the, uh, if it's more than 35% of their affordable income of this tenants, he can say, no, it's not allowed. And then he has to say, okay, you have to modernize my my um, apartment, but it's not allowed to give m more than 25% of my income. That's another uh, situation. Um, then, uh, yet, when he, is, uh, he has an apartment, in principle, the, 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 when he will raise up the, uh, the rent, he has uh, different types. First, he has to say, okay, I give three uh, prices of uh, similar apartments. Or he, uh, he say, okay, I uh, give um, uh, um, I, we have first three apartments, three, uh, three um, um, compar apartments, um, but it's um, difficult uh, to go. Perhaps there, there are other three apartments, and you can go to court, and there are the cost of expert in uh, unsuccessful for the unsuccessful party. Um, then. Um, Then uh, there is a possibility to have this index we make in, from the town. We have this index of uh, uh, what is a normal rent, and we make it um, we make it by um, by the town. Uh, but we have to know that it's not the market index, but it's only the index of the. Uh, three, four last years of the rent uh, who increased in the four last uh, for the uh, for the rent who increased during the last four years or a new tenants agreement. Um, um, when. And we make this um, uh, this uh, recept, uh, we make this um, representative uh, meat spiegel together with the organization of landlords and the uh, organization of tenants, and we need a representative data collection um, and a method of data assessment in accurate with the recognized, recognized scientific principles, and the results should be documented and very uh, fitable. Um, and we have it recompiled every four years, and between this year, every two years, we can make a higher, uh, higher the rent uh, in the uh, normal uh, um, um, index of um, index uh, we have in every two years index. Um, 
And we in in Bonn, we so we have in these all four years we collected all this information. So we had three percent of every house. So that means in Bonn, that three hundred twenty thousand inhabitants. That means two thousand eight hundred thirty-six questions we made. Um, and we had the other part we had from uh, landlords and um, so uh, and we make it in a special way because um, we said um, uh, we our our people who work for the city they go to the families and they ask them what is what what is your contract and how much you have to pay what was the last rising the rent and and uh, and so on and uh, so we have a very secure situation that uh, we know exactly what are these prices in and uh, then we have a system of um, um, and we have to uh, yeah, reduce and we ask for different questions first we have to to take out the garage prices and uh, the service costs and um, then um, then we have to ask some questions about infrastructure and uh, public transport and so on and what we have so that means the, the uh, question of location what we can have uh, then the construction differences, um, number of floors, etc., etc., um, and then we have a mathematical formula uh, about um, this uh, question about this. Uh, yes, and then uh, the city council has to uh, uh, accept it, and uh, we have it on our uh, city website, so you can see what exactly is the rent for your building. So that's the question I had to explain. Then perhaps a little bit about the other uh, questions he mentioned. We have, uh, as a system, as I said, uh, only 10% of our houses are social houses, and we have a lack of it. So we uh, try to say in every part where the new buildings, uh, the Land, uh, landlord has to, or the owner has to build 30% uh, of uh, social flat everywhere in the town. So we have not only in this uh, low price area, we have this, uh, this social houses, so we have it in future everywhere in the town. That's very important that we have it so that it's not only a social, uh, uh, social uh, uh, bad uh, conditions in these areas. And uh, secondly, we have this problem with this, um, with this Airbnb too, and it's not allowed for us. We have Zweckentfremdungsverordnung, that means if there is any, um, uh, there's not rented a house or someone is there, for example, with this uh, holiday rented, it's not allowed, and we go to this play and it's, uh, we give the fine to them. That's possible in our town, not everywhere, and we fight between the towns if it's possible or not. But nowadays in, in Bonn, I, we think, I said uh, we have 320,000 inhabitants and more or less 120,000 um, flats, uh, rented flats. Uh, that means, uh, and we have uh, now, I, we think, uh, 5,000 uh, flats from Airbnb. So that's a lot of uh, a lot of stuff, and so we try to fight against them like you. So, okay, thank you very much. It was a little bit complicated. My English was not so good, but I, you have this plan. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Bernhard. Your explanation was excellent and very developed. Uh, now, last but not least, I have the pleasure to introduce you Ms. Rona Brown from the Greater London Authority, and I guess that she can talk uh, as about, uh, she can explain a lot about this relation between private and public uh, when working in rent systems. Buenos dias, bon dia, 
Bom dia. <laughs> Guten Tag. Um, leider kann ich, oh, I'm not going to do my presentation in Spanish or German or Portuguese, but in English. Um, thanks very much for inviting me. I think really these days people from the UK should be very grateful to be invited to European conferences and asked to speak on anything. So I'm very happy to have this opportunity. Um, as has been said, my name is Rona Brown and I am the Private Rented Sector Programme Manager at the Greater London Authority. And for those of you who don't know what the Greater London Authority is, that's the municipal government um, for London. Now, uh, the GLA was established in 2001 after a 20-year hiatus during which London had no overarching government or mayor at all whatsoever. So we currently sit above the 33 local authorities that make up Greater London as a strategic authority, but I think as you'll come to see from my presentation, the fact that we've had no strategic government for 20, 25 years prior to the establishment is really become a bit of a problem for London and I, and I hope my presentation will show you why. Um, so, what am I gonna talk to you about today? Well, um, what I thought I might do is give you a bit uh, of an overview of London's private rented sector to begin with, um, to try and explain the really kind of unique situation that we're up against in London and kind of how uh, the kind of challenges that we have to, to face as policymakers. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit about the current regulatory framework for rents in London. That's going to be a very short section. Um, and then I'm going to tell you about the rent regulation debate that we currently have going on in the UK, which is pretty intense. Um, so in terms of my role, what I do is I advise the Mayor of London, or uh, rather in particular the Deputy Mayor for Housing, about the private rented sector and what on earth we should do about it. Um, and just as uh, a bit of context, um, as many of you will know, we're facing a really very intense housing crisis in London at present. So uh, the best estimates that we have suggest that we should be building in London 60,000 affordable homes every year just to meet the backlog of housing that we have and our predicted future need. And for some context, one of our best years of late, we built about 20,000 homes. So it just really shows you the kind of scale uh, that we're up against in terms of uh, meeting the housing demand that we have in our city. Um, we recently surpassed our previous population peak, which by the way was in 1939, and we now have over 8 million people living in London and population growing at a rapid rate. Um, this has in turn driven demand for housing, as you would expect, and driven house prices up. But at the same time, we've also had a sort of 30, 40 year period of disinvestment in social housing. So whilst we still have a much higher proportion of social housing than uh, the other cities who've spoken, uh, or some of the other cities that have spoken here this morning, so we still have over 20% social housing in London, uh, that has really been being sort of gradually decimated over the last sort of 30 to 40 years and has become quite a residual housing stock that really only the very poorest people in London can access. Um, and at the same same time, because house prices have risen, home ownership is uh, s s uh, swiftly drifting out of reach for most people. So as a result, we're ending up with an awful lot more people in London's private rented sector. So what does it look like, this uh, private rented sector that we have? I often like to start by talking about the size of our sector, just to try and put a little perspective on what it is that we're dealing with here. So uh, in fact, I, I did a bit of maths, and I hope I did it right. Uh, before I came to the conference, and I believe that we, the number of people we have living in London's private rented sector, which is 2.4 million people, is equivalent to the entire populations of Lisbon, Barcelona, and Bonn put together. Not the people they have living in the private rented sector, the number of people they have living in the city. Um, so hopefully that just kind of gives you an idea of the scale of the challenge that we have ahead of us. Um, that constitutes almost 30% of Londoners, uh, and more than half a million of those renters are in fact children. So about 600,000 children we currently have living in London's private rented sector. Um, unlike some other parts of the UK, people from pretty much every different income percentile live in London's private rented sector in equal proportions. So that means that in London, anyone from a toilet cleaner to a banker can be a private renter, which is very, very different to the rest of the UK, where it tends to still be a tenure for poorer, uh, lower income groups. Um, and it's quite important to note that our private rented market is a real cottage industry. So we have 
just over a million private rented sector properties in London, uh, most of which are owned by landlords who own one or two properties. So it's very, very difficult to kind of drive professionalization in our sector since there's so little involvement from large-scale institutions or large-scale professional landlords. Um, in addition, in terms of the economics, rental yields are very, very low in London because, of course, capital costs are very high in terms of investing in the market. Um, but, of course, capital growth has been enormous. So the returns from investing in the rental market are still considered to be huge, even though a lot of people are not making an awful lot of profit on the monthly rents that they charge. Um, this is uh, The notable exception to this is rental properties in the very low, very poor quality end of the market, where, shall we say, landlords are very much sweating their assets. Um, as a result of some of the conditions I've just outlined, we really have quite poor conditions in London's private rental market. Things are improving gradually, but as this graph here shows, um, about 30% of private rented sector homes in London are considered non-decent by the government standard. And that compares very unfavorably with people in home ownership and in social rent. Um, the private rented sector also has the largest proportion of the least energy efficient homes, which obviously has a negative impact on domestic carbon emissions and what we call fuel poverty. Um, and a landlord survey conducted by the government, uh, albeit some time ago now, uh, concluded that two thirds of landlords, so those people renting out one or two homes, had no awareness whatsoever of the very basic legal responsibilities that apply to them. So, in terms of regulation, I'm going to come back to this a little bit later in my talk, um, but despite the fact that we have one of the biggest rental markets in Europe, and we have 600,000 children living in that market, we also have one of the least regulated rental markets in the world. Um, our landlords at home like to moan about how much legislation, in fact, does apply to them, um, but in fact... Our other large uh, European city neighbours and even our neighbours to the north in Scotland have much more substantial regulation to protect renters than we do in the United Kingdom. Uh, sorry, in, in England, I should say. Um, there is quite a lot of regulation that applies to the private rented sector, but it's piecemeal. Um, it's what we call a patchwork quilt of different political priorities on enforcement, rents, and investment that date back more than 30 years and are more or less completely lacking in any strategic direction whatsoever. Um, one Chancellor of the Exchequer will create tax incentives to encourage buy-to-let investment. Another Chancellor will take them away. And there's really no kind of long-term planning that's available to investors as a result. The thorny question of affordability is, of course, what we're talking about today. Uh, this is the sort of picture that the UK tabloids like to run regularly, on a monthly basis at least, um, really indicating the kind of scale of the, uh, of the affordability crisis that we have. Um, the huge amount of pressure that there is on supply means that it's very, very difficult to get landlords and letting agents to kind of change or improve their behavior voluntarily. In other words, it's a seller's market, and there's no commercial incentive to provide a good service to tenants. Um, of course, this picture has dramatically pushed rents up. So the average monthly rent in London now is £1,495 a month. So just shy of £1,500 a month. And that's the median, I should say, for any statisticians out there. Um, so just to put that in the context of the rest of the UK, London has massively moved away from the rest of the UK market. Um, the average rent for a one-bedroom home in London is now um, equivalent or greater than the rent for a four-bedroom home in any other part of the United Kingdom. Um, now, this picture has been a bit complicated in terms of rental growth in London. That's one of the things that makes um, proposals around rent stabilization very, very difficult to assess. Um, so between the early noughties and 2011, 2010, um, rents were actually increasing at or below inflation in London. Um, but uh, wage growth was also stagnant, so affordability was still worsening even during that period. However, since 2011, until sort of really just the last year or so, rents actually rose significantly faster than earnings um, and faster than the rate of inflation. So again, really since 2011, affordability has worsened pretty dramatically in London. And that's where a lot of the pressure has come from um, on the mayor and on the government to do something about rents. And as you can see, uh, the kind of 
impact on affordability has really been quite significant. So we now have 60% of renting families in London who say that they find it very or fairly difficult to pay their rent. Um, and this graph here shows the proportion of incomes spent on rent. So the figure that we like to use is the one that includes benefits, which is this one just here, that includes all household reference persons and um, all benefits. So all the income that could go towards paying rent is included in this. And people are still paying, uh, on average, 38% of their incomes. Of course, if you exclude benefits and if you look only at the main earner in the household, that goes up quite a lot. But still, that's a very high uh, a figure for private renters. And as you can see... Um, uh, the affordability for private renters is much worse than it is for owner occupiers, which is the blue bar, um, or for social renters, which is the red bar. Um, now, in fact, we're, we're in a very interesting position at the moment because in real terms, growth in private rents has actually fallen sharply in the last year um, as nominal growth uh, has softened and also as inflation has risen. Now, some of that may be uh, impacts of uh, some of the uh, <clears throat> political turmoil that we have going on in the UK and may not last long. We don't know. Um, but also, we have also managed to increase house building a little bit in the last year or two. And again, that can have really quite a quick impact on rents. So, again, if we are going to start building 60,000 homes a year, which I very much doubt, but if we are, that could really quite quickly start to turn things around on rents, which again makes the question of what intervention should we put in place quite difficult to answer. So what's the kind of picture in terms of security of tenure? Well, it's pretty poor. And I think this is one of the, the areas in which the UK really differs significantly from a lot of the rest of the world, and uh, particularly the rest of Europe. Um, UK tenants have very weak rights. Hardly anyone in the United Kingdom is offered a tenancy of longer than 12 months. And six months is also quite common. Um, landlords cannot increase the rent during the term of that tenancy, whether it's six months or 12 months. Um, but they can, uh, as soon as that tenancy ends or as soon as that tenancy moves on to a rolling monthly tenancy, which is something a lot of tenants are living on in London. So that means literally from month to month, that contract could be ended or that rent could be increased. Um, we also have something called no-fault evictions, which doesn't exist in a lot of other countries, um, whereby a landlord can legally evict a tenant with two months' notice for any reason whatsoever or rather for no reason whatsoever. Um, this is obviously particularly worrying given the situation that I outlined previously where we now have so many more children living in the private rented sector and that having become a much more insecure living option. So that has huge potential impacts on early years development, on school opportunities um, and kind of access to social services. So um, one thing that is a good picture about the London rental market is access to the sector. Um, so this graph shows you how many kind of recently arrived uh, adults in London are living in the private rented sector. The, the yellow bar is the private rented sector, in case you can't see that. Um, so as you can see, um, although the London private rented sector is expensive and very poorly regulated, it's also very easy to access, providing you have that money. So generally speaking, in London, a six-week deposit one month's rent in advance and a basic credit check is all you need to rent a property to secure a tenancy. Um, and for the most part, that process is very quick. You can visit a place, sign a contract and transfer a deposit all in one day and be moving in a couple of days later, which is very, very different to a lot of other countries where rents are more um, heavily regulated and where there is greater security of tenure. Um, However, the restrictions can be much tighter for those coming from overseas and especially for those who are not in work. So recently arrived migrants and often very low income households who are not in work sometimes end up in the informal part of the sector, um, which is kind of a funny thing to say about a sector that is already completely unregulated. In addition to that, we have also got an informal sector. Um, but uh, they, they tend to arrive there and end up living with landlords in very, very poor properties, um, landlords who have no intention of complying with their legal obligations, and who effectively exploit renters who need a home without having to answer too many questions. And um, as we'll see, this isn't even necessarily a particularly cheap option. So this uh, is a little look at our informal sector. Um, as you can see, uh, quite sort of typical looking uh, Victorian Edwardian uh, London townhouses. This is what my partner calls typical English housing. Uh, uh, and um, sort of flats above shops, that sort of thing. From the outside, they look quite nice and kind of, uh, you know, historical and cute. Um, 
And this kind of letting in these types of properties happens freely all across London, um, which is largely unchecked by local authorities who are struggling with serious cutbacks from central government. Um, inside, they look a bit different. So I don't know how, how, how well these pictures are coming out to people at the back here, but um, really this is a very, very common picture in pretty much all areas of London, is that you will have a proportion of private rented homes it, which inside look a lot like this. And they tend to be highly overcrowded, um, extremely insanitary, highly dangerous from a fire safety perspective, um, really just about as bad as you can imagine. Effectively, we have hidden slums right, right all the way across London. And landlords who own properties like these can very comfortably be making 40 to 50,000 pounds a year in rent um, uh, from property like this, of which they often have a small portfolio. Um, so I think this is what I meant before when I said that at the lower end of the market, rental yields are extremely good. So what is our current regulatory framework? As I said, this will be a very short section. Um, <laughs> this, uh, this graph, those, these graphs here, which I, I apologize, I'm not sure, how, um, not sure how easy they are to read, but uh, I, I should have drawn some little red arrows on them. But they show... Um, rent control in the private, ma private rental market in terms of all the different countries in Europe. And they also show, the bottom one shows tenant and landlord regulations in the private rental market in all the different countries in Europe. And you can't really see from, from uh, the audience, but Great Britain is fourth from the bottom and third from the bottom um, on, on both of these graphs. And I think that, that really just shows you the extent to which we are lagging behind a lot of other European countries, particularly those larger European countries that might be comparable uh, to London in terms of rent regulation. In terms of the other three countries, uh, three, other three cities who are on the panel with me today, they are all in the top half of the table on both, on both of these graphs. So that really shows you kind of the, the difference between us and our and our, uh, the majority of our European contemporaries. Um, so what is our current uh, rent regulation system? Well, um, we have some residual Fair Rent Act tenancies with uh, controlled rents. Now, uh, Fair Rent Act, uh, the Fair Rent Act uh, was abolished in 1989, but effectively what that did was it was a system of rent regulation, which was really a very strict rent cap system. So for instance, in the UK, from 1933 to 1954, rents were completely capped at 1933 levels. From 1954 until 1989, they were allowed to rise a little bit, but frankly, there was very, very little incentive to invest in the UK rental market. Um, rents were absolutely held down with hard and fast, kind of old-fashioned rent cap system. Um, now, uh, uh, in 1989, we completely deregulated the private rented sector, so we sort of went from the sublime to the ridiculous, in the sense that we sort of said, okay, Rent caps have resulted in complete disinvestment in the market. We've kind of ended up with this rump of very, very poor quality private rented properties. We want that investment to come back into the, the housing market. Let's completely deregulate it and throw, throw the baby out with the bathwater, as we often uh, say in the UK. Um, so now we have about 100,000 remaining uh, fair rent act tenancies. And that means that, that uh, these, these rents... Sure. These rents are controlled, um, but um, and and uh, people who live in them have the opportunity to go to the council uh, and have their rent checked uh, and sort of say, I, I think I'm not being being charged my fair rent anymore. So they they have a kind of mechanism to to make sure that they are being charged the rent that they're supposed to be being charged, and they will keep that rent effectively until the day they die if they stay in that property. But as soon as that tenant moves on, that property becomes deregulated. So obviously at present, it's mostly older people living in this type of tenancy, um, and they are uh, very, very quickly um, uh, be, being kind of uh, deregulated and turned into kind of mainstream private rented sector properties. Um, the, the vast majority of the rest of tenants live in what is called assured shorthold tenancies, and that is those very short six to 12 month tenancies I was speaking about earlier. Um, now, they, uh, the landlord cannot raise the rent during the term of that tenancy, but obviously it's very short, so that doesn't really kind of p protect tenants from rent increases. There is a rent tribunal service that you can go to to say, I think my landlord is charging me an unfair rent, and they will assess whether your rent is in fact at market rent levels, similar in some respects to the Meech Beagle. Um, but because landlords have that ability to, to undertake a no-fault eviction, um, most tenants don't avail themselves of this opportunity because they're too scared that the landlord will evict them if they successfully challenge the rent. 
Um, in terms of tenancies, um, the landlord must honour the length of the assured shorehold tenancy, but again, it's very short, so that's not much of a hardship, uh, and give two months' notice of eviction, as I said. Um, there are a very small number of exceptions um, to the use of no-fault evictions, but generally they, they, there is not much protection for tenants. So, um, what are the mayor's powers? Well, I'll cut this short because I am uh, rapidly, have rapidly run out of time, in fact. We don't have a lot of powers to deal with this, is the short uh, answer. Oh, quite similar, I think, to what was being said about Barcelona. Um, we really get most of our uh, funding and most of our power comes from central government in the UK, and the mayor has no legislative powers and no ability to control rents whatsoever. But what we do have is a massive political platform. The mayor is one of the most recognisable British politicians in the world at present, um, and that does give us an opportunity to t take some arguments to the government about what should be done in London. Um, particularly this government, which is at present rather weak. Um, we are undertaking various things uh, uh, in terms of improving standards and conditions in the private rented sector, but the question I would really like to have answered today is, what should we do about the rent regulation debate? Now, um, you might ask, why are we even asking this question if we have no powers to do anything about it? But uh, the fact is that the National Labour Party in Britain, who may well form the next government, and goodness knows how long this one is going to last, have said that they would like to introduce rent controls. And that puts the mayor under a lot of pressure to decide what he should say about this. However, we're very aware of some of the trade-offs that rent controls can bring. So there can be a negative impact on investment. Um, there certainly can be a negative impact on mobility. So all of those people who can currently very easily access a home in the private rented sector, even though it's expensive, uh, bringing in any form of rent stabilization and rent control could make that a lot more difficult. And I think that some of the examples in Germany have really shown that. Um, but in any case, we are facing huge public pressure to bring in rent controls. It is, what, it is the number one issue for renters in London, as you might imagine. Um, so I think what we're interested to know today from this discussion is how have some of the cities tackled those negative impacts of rent controls? And if you were starting again from today, would you do it the way that you're doing it now? Um, and, and I think we're really in a kind of uh, very early stage of, of our thinking about whether to, whether to advocate for rent control and rent stabilisation in the UK. And I'd really like to have um, a discussion about answering some of those questions today. So thank you very much. Hello? Hello, is it working? Hello? Hello? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Rona. It's also a pleasure for us to, to listen to some uh, contributors from the United Kingdom and how we, it will last. Uh, now they, uh, we open to your questions, so we can start whenever you want. I'm, I'm kind of interested in knowing uh, what the participants uh, think about the balance between intervening on housing markets and uh, aiding housing market dynamics, because as Rana said, there can be problems or there can be, you know, uh, some negative impacts. So should that be permanent? Should that be temporary? Thank you. I think it's very important now to regulate the housing market because uh, it, and to push new buildings, for example, in Germany and in your country, because we need a uh, 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 tradition of new buildings, it's very complicated in Germany to, to build a new uh, house because you have to wait a lot of it, uh, prove a lot of things. So it's very important uh, that you have a thinking that it, to regulate the existing housing because uh, normally someone he has money, he buys a huge house and then he writes a rent and uh, even though and it, he, if he make it with Airbnb, he make a lot of profit. Mm. And if you don't regulate it, it's not interesting to build a new house. Mm. So that's very important to have that kind of thinking to regulate the existing uh, market to create a new one. And we in Germany have a big discussion in the moment. They say if you regulate, nobody are interested to build a new house. But uh, I think it's nonsense mm. because uh, normally we have a lack of, uh, of uh, yeah, building possibilities in our town. 
And so we have to create the billion cost. We have a lot of money in the market and you have to go the money to these new buildings and not the two used buildings. I think that's very important. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that's a very good point. And I think one of the difficulties that we have in London is that it seems to me that um, examples from around the world where regulation um, of rent works best tends to be in cities that don't already have a huge supply crisis um, and also tends to be in countries where they have kind of additional um, support for investment. So, for instance, in Germany, I know that um, there is a very advantageous tax system for landlords to invest in their property and that is kind of all properly and strategically directed in all those different ways. And we don't have that in the UK. So I suppose my concern is, do we have the right preconditions to introduce rent stabilisation and not to, to damage new house building, as you say? And, and I, I think the conditions are a bit different, but I'm sure there's a lot that we could learn um, from your experience. Of course, it's very necessary to regulate the, 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 the price of... of, of um, um, is, uh, uh, renting. renting, the price of renting. Uh, I, I, I must add that in, in Spain, uh, um, the, the, the time for the, the minimum time for uh, to, to rent uh, uh, passed from five, five years to three years. But uh, uh, in this change, the, 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 the increasing of, of rent have no, no top. This is another change, uh, very, very, very important. For the reason it's, it's most important, this regulation, because uh, every owner could in increase the, 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 the rent as he won or she won. Uh, we think that th there are uh, three levels or three steps. The first step is to have this average of prices. All people know which is the prices in every area of the city and in, in different conditions. Uh, we, we have this first step. The second step is to find the right uh, tools to uh, uh, um, give a, 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 a price, give, give a, and help to uh, property owners that um, follow this this uh, average. And the third pass is to have the, lo the laws to uh, punish uh, uh, owners that uh, uh, make a very high uh, price for, the, for the, the houses. We are fighting for this uh, second step, f uh, finding the, the tools, and for the third step, that is a step that couldn't only be made by uh, the, not by the city, by the the uh, Catalonia uh, the, uh, um, Parliament or by state. I argue that that we should uh, regulate. Uh, um, well, that. The, but it, sorry, it must be a smart regulation because the, what is clear is that, the, especially in the cities, in the big cities, in the big urban uh, uh, European cities, the market is uh, clearly failing. Uh, it is not a sustainable situation. But uh, we, the public administration, has, have also often intervened uh, in a not a very smart way. Like uh, give, giving an example, almost always a form of subsidized renting, like of subsidizing public subsidizing private rental, just creates inflation. So that it might be as I think we we do in Lisbon and, and in Barcelona an emergency situation so that a certain amount of people don't lose that contract. But if you, if you open that to new contracts, you just add availability from the, a, a very stressed uh, uh, surge of, of housing against the, the well, the, the demand against, uh, against what it is. So most of, well, there is a lot of examples of good intentions, good intended uh, interventions from the public administration that in the end resulted the other way around. Uh, uh, so I do believe in, in, in solutions like the one I presented on per-equating the market, so regulating the market so that it becomes sustainable within also a sustainable economy. So sustaining uh, 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 the society in the city that needs to be there, that should be there, that should have the right to be there, but in a way that, that, it, that, we, that we can financially support it so so creating a smart loop on on where the money so understanding and regulating where the money comes and goes to 
so that it's it serves the 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 purpose of, of the city of the society and, and its citizens perhaps i have to explain a little bit the german situation because in germany if you rent a flat that means you can stay there until you die normally and that's a total difference between uh, spain for example because we normally we live all our life and you can only push out if the landlord has a real interest and you can go to court and prove if this interest of the landlord is right or not. So that's a big difference because we, are, we have no time limited renting. So that means that it's totally crazy and that's our basic law that if you rent something you rent it for all life because the right of the tenants that's something yes it's something very important for us because that's you living middle the point of your living and so it's the uh, same level of uh, rights as the landlord has from his uh, ownership you know that's very important to think on this and uh, if the situation in spain is for example you know, madrid don't do it and so I think what you can do, you can do to create new owned, uh, yeah, state owned or town owned uh, organizations who own these new apartments and they give contracts for lifelong living there and then you have the possibility to rise up. You have don't can't wait uh, for, for Madrid to change uh, regulation for uh, tenants mm -hmm. situation. Can I ask a question about that? Which is, um, I think, uh, in the UK, we, we very much think that there should be a move towards much more kind of indefinite tenancies rather than um, particularly time-limited tenancies because um, it seems logical to us. But um, how do you avoid the situation that if a landlord could potentially be renting this property for 30 years, um, presumably the barriers to renting that property are quite high, you must have to give a big deposit and lots and lots of references, etc. Um, you know, how do you make it easier for people to access that housing? Yes, uh, it's only to, to, to have a deposit, it means only for two months, it's regulation. Only the, the, there is a limitation of two months and uh, yes, he has to pay and if he can't pay, then you have the possibility to push him out uh, after he has uh, more than two two months without paying, then you can push him out. And on the other side, uh, we have for the people who uh, accept, uh, who have uh, public finance for because they are without jobs we have 10 percent of our all of our uh, yeah, rents of the family are paid by our town 10 percent that means in the year in the town of 320,000 inhabitants we are we have 120 million of subsidies for tenants, 120 million a year. And that's all my discussion to say, okay, we have to build houses and not, uh, we have to pay a finance behind this market, you know, from our public pocket. So it's more important to build houses and to, re with this reduced price of six euro 50, and not to pay 10 euro, for example, for someone who is jobless, and so we have to pay it. So it's very important to have this new thinking. Thank you. Um, well, I think that we have seen that this reality has made massive effects on the city and on the rest of policies, and even on the competitivity of the city, and of the companies that are settled in it. So it's, it's, all, it's not only a matter, and it's a basic matter of, of human rights and uh, of right to housing, but it's also a, a thing that concerns the, the, the rest of the city. So uh, what factors should be considered while intervening? What, what, uh, what factors do you, do you think that should cities consider while intervening in housing markets since their effects are so massive and so transversal? So when and why should we intervene? Like the uh, uh, well, one factor, one factor is when the 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 housing on the market is 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 not of well is less in in quantity to to the needs, and when the prices are are 
over 30% of what people can afford. That's, the, that's when we need to intervene. Uh, and there are strong, hard, well, there are easier and stronger ways to intervene. And, and there's also uh, the, kind, the, 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 the tax system can influence within certain limits on how to, to influence the market one way or the other. Like, just go back to the other question. Like, we are making the, the, the taxes on, on houses being rent, uh, unver well, inversely uh, proportional to the number of years of contract. So if you have a 10-year contract, you pay, lo you pay lower taxes on it. If you have a very short term, you pay very high taxes on that. And that's a way to influence and still having the same average tax revenue to the city. So there's, there are smarter and softer and harder ways to intervene. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, that that's right, is that if you were, I think that's what concerns us in the UK, is that if you were to do this, you kind of need to look at it holistically. You can't just say, right, we're going to have a rent break or we're going to... Um, index rents, you kind of have to say, and we're going to incentivize uh, longer tenancies through the taxation system, or we're going to uh, implement a system of an indefinite tenure, um, and we are going to massively increase affordable house building at the same time. You know, I kind of think it's a picture for us of having to pull on a lot of different levers at once, and that is something that we are very, very bad at doing in the UK, <laughs> um, because everything is so centralized. Um, so I think it's something... Uh, I honestly think this is more going to be a question for the next government in the UK, but I, I, I agree with all the things that you've identified as kind of things that you have to consider if, if you're going to do this. And, and, and I liked your point about um, uh, doing smart regulation. Yes, we need this because, uh, for example, for this money we pay for people without jobs and so on. So it's very important that it's not too high. Secondly, we need our town for our citizen because we need the normal people living in the city because otherwise our economy will go down because when the people have no possibility to live in the city, we have a big transport problem and we have a big economic problem and so on and so on. That means uh, the city is, uh, the, you have to care that everybody can live in our city and not to be expelled and uh, have no possibility to reach a uh, labor place. So it's a lot of costs if you spell them, uh, put them out of the cities. We are search, searching for a solutions, but we, we don't know exactly the solution. We are trying different solutions. We think one thing very important, uh, even symbolical, is a change of mentality, a general change of mentality. Uh, another thing is a change in, in the laws, uh, national and um, uh, autonomous laws. This, this is a, a framework that is very necessary. Another thing is to, to search in the line of new taxes, uh, taxes uh, against the, the, the bad use of the house, the, the increasing of prices and taxes and help, um, that help uh, exception of taxes or help on rehabilitation and other things when uh, the, it's followed the, 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 the average of prices. And other thing that we are uh, trying during these two years, but it's not, not easy, is a kind of agreement with the uh, private sector, with the uh, um, housing sector, to, to make agreements in, in rent, in, in promoting, in, in, in land and, and other things. But we are trying. In fact, we have no experience in, in Spain in, uh, on, on regulation, and we have no experience to fight with uh, this kind of uh, sequence on different crises on housing. Uh, but for the reason we are, we are, we are searching now. No? And, and even uh, in relation with Portugal, Portugal have a little more social housing uh, average than, than Spain. And in Portugal there were a, a syndicate of uh, tenants from the 20s. I, I know a syndicate of tenants existed from uh, 1920, 1924. And in Spain, the, the syndicate of, of tenants is created some months ago. We have no tradition to defend the interest of uh, tenants in, in the cities and in the country. Because, uh, I'm the president of the tenant organization, and we in Bonn, we have uh, 
23,000 uh, members in Bonn from 30, uh, 30, uh, 320,000 inhabitants, 23,000 people are in my organization, not people, uh, households. You know, that, uh, that means we are strong and we are not fighting only for regulations and private regulation. We help them, the people to, to have to, when they have problems with the landlord, but we are pushing the uh, new law and we're pushing the building of houses and so on. So it's very important to have a pressure group for this kind of people. So, uh, I mean, we're open to the questions of the audience, if anybody wants to ask about these questions. Uh, I don't know if I will be able to speak, taking into account that we are all frozen here. I don't know up there, but here we are all frozen. Um, one, one question that I, I address uh, almost always that we have this type of discussions with uh, uh, people from Germany is uh, uh, in the debate here in Spain about rent regulation, rent caps, uh, when you uh, advocate for s some type of regulation, even though it could be very little regulation and very smart regulation, regardless of what you say, uh, they always uh, counter with these two arguments uh, if we regulate the market, the demand, I'm sorry, the, the offer will go down, the offer will be reduced, so the price will go up, and we will have informal markets. Uh, of course, your cities are a living proof that that doesn't happen, because you don't have more informal market than we have, and your price, your average price in rental is a bit better than ours, because if you compare the prices of the rental market in Germany with the purchasing capacity of the people, the affordability is better than ours. It's not good, but it's better than ours. So uh, I, will, I will ask about how can we persuade, uh, persuade the people who are against any regulation of the market, any whatsoever, uh, on the fact that some wise regulation it's better even for the markets, because your markets are working much better than ours. And, uh, and please uh, give us ideas, because um, whatever it comes from Germany, it has a, there's a predisposition about uh, thinking that it's intelligent and is well done. <laughs> so, so the southern part of Europe, we need your example in order to uh, be present in that debate and demonstrate that some wise regulation works better than no regulation whatsoever. As I said, I think it's enough money on the market because uh, the interest is low and so the people, they, they ask for investments. You know, and if they know uh, there is a possibility to have a stabilized investment, it's better than to to have a fund or something or to go to bank and you have only a small of interest. You know, it's so. I think it's enough money on the market. First, uh, secondly, um, yeah, I think the situation of owning flats situation in in Spain. 95% of the people are owners. That's very crazy. You know, that's very crazy because people have no money and even when they are poorer, then they have no possibility to go to bank, especially in this new bank regulation and get money for buy a house. And on the other side, if they are bankrupt because they can't, can't afford anymore the mortgage, then they are kicked out and they have a lot of money and even though in in Spain uh, they have no possibility to say okay I am 
private bankrupt and it's not possible to get money from us anymore because in Germany you can have a private bankruptcy. So that's very bad for the market to give only this private. If only the speculation is I, I, buy, a, I buy a house and I can't afford it from, from my income. I can't afford it, but I speculate on it three times uh, three time more value after 10 years, then that is a speculation. But it means, uh, for example, in Spain or in London, in some the prices are going down and then a lot of people are bankrupt, you know. That's not a good market and you have to, uh, you have to bring it in the brain that that's not good for people who have low income that they, they must be uh, owner of, uh, of a house. That's very bad for the economy and for the people. So it's very important that existing landlords and existing landlords means not only cities, but for example, but enterprise, big enterprises, they should build houses for their people or churches or trade unions, all this uh, people has to do something for for the people you know and so they have to invest for a, such a system of better living for all people so that's a question of social yeah a social situation what happens if someone is bankrupt and what happens then you know you can can't destroy families only why they have no possibility on the on the market so it's very important to to build rental houses for this kind of people and I think it's enough money and everybody can understand how it's worked. In Germany, you can raise up the rent, but you can't raise up the rent in, in unbelievable unbel right? You are always to, to care what is normal, what's normal price, and, and this possibility can, you can raise up the rent. And that means that means enough because a house 100 years old is three times uh, you earned the money. From what from your investment, you know, so it's only the banks have the possibility if they sell this house for a million, which is built hundred years ago for ten thousand with ten thousand day mark. You know, that's crazy that this kind of uh, uh, speculation is made. So that is a total discussion and I think it's uh, enough enough money on the market, it's not enough space and we have to create new spaces for housing, especially in these centers uh, of growth, you know, we have. Thank you. Any other question in the audience? Yes, we do have more questions. My question is much more, do you see a need or much more a chance of limited profit housing associations or not-for-profit housing associations? Because in Austria, one of our main pillars are these not-for-profit or limited profit housing associations because they are only allowed to charge the cost rent and they have to reinvest their profits, which is really important to stay up to a certain standard. Jet, what you've been explaining about London is really shocking. I mean, we've been there more than a hundred years ago and we're going back again. So I thought, or I'm just asking, do you see this as a, as a chance to move forward in the affordable housing sector? Yeah, I mean, uh, ooh, <laughs> it's a bit loud now. Uh, Not-for-profit housing providers um, do play a huge role in the housing market in the UK. I mean, they deliver uh, at least half of all of the affordable housing that we are building. Um, and they uh, are sometimes huge organisations who own sort of uh, 50, 60,000 homes. Um, so we, we do already have a very established market and lots of them are keen to do more. But the difficulty is that um, a lot of those organisations were previously predicated on getting a lot of grant from the government to build those homes. Um, and that enabled them to charge very, very cheap rents because the capital costs of the build were met by the government. So, uh, you know, in the kind of... Um, 80s and 90s, you would have a situation where the government was giving 95% of the build cost of the home was provided by the government. Uh, now we're in a situation where about 40, 35% of the build cost is contributed by the government. So the rest of that money has to come from somewhere. And in many cases, it comes from cross subsidizing by building market rented housing or by building market sale housing or by building shared ownership housing. Um, 
or simply by charging higher rents to poor people. Um, and that is just simply unavoidable because that money has to come from somewhere. Um, so I think uh, although those organisations are ambitious and we rely on them to a very large extent, they are, their hands are tied a little bit by the fact that uh, the, the, the disinvestment from government has been so substantial. I mean, just to put that into context, in 2010, the election that we had just after the financial crash, obviously public sector cuts were made to all government departments by that new government, but the biggest cut by far was made to the UK Housing Department, a 63% cut in the grant for building social housing in, in the UK. So, I mean, we, we just simply haven't been able to recover from that. And I think until we start to see that much more serious investment coming through from the government again, it's going to be very difficult for us to do that. But, but, uh, but I absolutely take your point that those organisations are, are key in helping us to kind of maintain that network of safety for those vulnerable low-income households. Just to, to add something from a, a, different, uh, a different perspective that we have in Portugal. Well, first, that doesn't exist in Portugal. So all social housing is public. Uh, Something which we also don't have is relevant uh, uh, pension funds. So there is not that much in our economy uh, funds who are more alike to do low risk, low, low profit investments. And that's why we are working on, on attracting them to Portugal. Because if the management of uh, the program I was telling you about, which is basically the the municipality has the the land or the buildings to be renovated and basically just opens the 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 management of, of that business to any uh, uh, organization that is willing to invest the point is if the investment is made between let's say a, a danish uh, 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 pension fund and and uh, and the non-profit organization that knows how to design and to manage uh, housing not meant for profit, to be rented, they will easily win our our public procurement uh, system, because they will they will need less uh, uh, part of the property to remain theirs in the end of the contract. So, the, the point is yes, we want, but we we are still missing the the the, the investment. And then if it's public, the tradition is that if the investment is public, then we manage ourselves like the public administration. So that's the... Uh, as I said, we have only 10% of social houses. That's too low. And uh, so we will rise it up. But now we have a discussion between the government and between the regional parliaments because for tax regulations, so that uh, uh, so that uh, the investment is not coming from 2019 from the state, but coming from the regional parliaments. I, we don't know exactly if they have enough money to uh, to create this market. So that's uh, in the moment a big discussion between state and regional parliaments, who is care, caring for this kind of investment. Secondly, we had this this, uh, this organization that's non-profit organizations, and we still have them in some uh, towns, for example, in my towns, but uh, we have not in, yeah, they, they collapse and they are not allowed, and you know, they're, they're not necessary that they continue anymore. So that was the wrong way, and now it's very difficult. And we have a, we had a problem that a lot of uh, the, a lot of uh, enterprises sold their sold their, uh, for example, for these international funds. We have the same problem, and we have a special uh, tax problem in Germany that uh, they don't have to pay pet taxes, so they can collect uh, a lot of uh, housing companies and uh, and so and so and so we try to change the tax situation that it's not so interested for these international funds anymore to go on our market and we try to discuss it in the moment to invent a new 
um, yeah, non-profit, uh, bigger non-profit sector in Germany. That's very important, I think, so because it's a lot of money. As I told, my town, 320,000 inhabitants, 120 million a year for uh, subsidies for uh, housing. You know, that's important. So we need, we need other ways. Thank you. Uh, any other question in the audience? Yes, one there. Hello, my name is Irene. I'm from Observatory Desk. It's a human rights center, and we work mainly right to housing and right to the city. I have three quick questions. The first one is about the supply. Um, when we say that there is less supply, at least in Barcelona, I'm not sure if, and, and I think you said the same in, in Lisbon, I'm not sure if the problem is that the supply, I mean, we have the same houses uh, to rent, but they are more expensive, so the supply moved to more to a luxury market or other kind of, of tenants. Um, the second question is about um, in London, because you said, at least what I said in the, in the PowerPoint is that in, in London, you have less tenants than in the whole country, and I thought it was, I mean, at least in, no? Okay, because I, okay, okay, because I was shocked because here, tenants in the cities is, in the main cities is where you have more percentage of tenants. Ah, uh, yeah, no, sorry, I think, I think what I was saying is that we, uh, uh, that it, I, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> uh, okay. uh, well, I, I, I didn't mean to anyway. No, we have, um, so I think there's about 5 million renters in the whole of the United Kingdom, and we have 2.4 million of them in London. Okay, I... I, uh, I sorry, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I really apologise if that wasn't clear, I'm no, sorry. No, I must have seen the image um, were wrong. I don't know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I think that what she was saying is that the difference between London and the rest of UK is that yeah. in London, tenants belong to all the social classes, and in the rest of UK tenants uh, tend to belong to lower classes or working classes. I think that that's no, what she said. No, I must be wrong. It was about how the percentage of tenants, of people with mortgages, people with uh, homeowners. It was about that, but maybe I was wrong. Oh, yeah. So we have about 30% of Londoners who are private renters, and nationally that figure is about 19% of the UK is a private renter. So um, it is, it's our fastest growing tenure in the UK, but also in London, it is our, actually our largest tenure if you split home ownership out into those who own with a mortgage and those who own outright. Um, so, it, so home ownership overall is larger than private renting. It's about 45%. Um, but um, if you split it into those two categories, private rent is actually larger. And also private renting is growing, whereas home ownership and social renting are both receding. Okay, and just to finish, um, I participate in the new tenants um, association, tenants union we have here, and I've been talking to the one that existed that exists in in Lisbon, but I think it's it's an old one, and also um, with some people in London. Um, but here we have the problem that yes, we can lobby and we can try to be strong, but the problem is that when do we do legal advice, for example, um, it's very difficult because laws are so against tenants that there's nothing we can do or at least it's very few what we can do. Um, and I don't know if, if in, in your countries it's um, the tenants associations, they are more like um, marketing and they have more this propaganda side or if they are also giving services or I don't know. Um, so in, in London, we don't really have uh, a tenants union. So there are kind of um, various efforts being made at present to establish one. But I think it's a very, very difficult thing to do in London because as you, as you can see from my presentation, it's a very transient tenure. So people are moving on all the time. It's, it's not uncommon. I mean, I, I've lived in London for 10 years and I've moved six times. And it's not uncommon for kind of people to, to churn in that way. So it's very difficult, I think, for people to establish really good uh, tenant organizations like they have in Germany, um, simply because it's very difficult to, to kind of find these people and know who they are and, and, and keep in touch with them when they're moving all the time. Um, so we, we don't really have a very good system in the UK and it's, um, it's something that I think makes it very difficult because as, as you said, it's very difficult sometimes for tenants, private tenants to access um, uh, legal support or advice um, and I think that's something that's, that's really missing in the UK. To 
two questions. Uh, first, the the shortage of, of supply is dramatically true on on the renting because it is clearly way more profitable to apply your your real estate in building a hotel, doing a, a, well Airbnb, well selling it or or, or or renting it for for other purposes rather than renting for housing for long term housing that's the that that's the reason even when i prefer just to keep it uh, and this is true to the to the to, to the degree that i often pref uh, uh, choose to keep the house empty than to rent it because of the risks and the, and the low profit i would get from it okay? uh, i would more easily sell it by, with a huge profit than to rent it. So the reason is the, the contrast of different levels of profit between what you can do out of your real estate property. <coughs> On the tenants' uh, organizations, well, in Lisbon, there is a very short percentage of uh, private renting. Okay? There is about 20% on what we call social housing. And uh, just to give a number that before it might, people might not completely understand or, co or be able to compare what we call social housing. In Lisbon, the average social rent in those 25,000 units is below 70 euros a, uh, a month. Okay? Uh, and and I, as I said, it's dynamic. So there are people paying 5 euros, there are people paying 300. But the average is below 70. Um, but so there is a very short uh, uh, private rental market, which also mean, and the one who, who that exists is very very old, and so the tenants' organization it is also very old and not very representative in, in meaning that it doesn't have a lot of members. But we, the public authority, the municipality, have been well promoting and supporting them to to get stronger and stronger. But if there is no market, there is no tenants, there is no no strength basically. But they do offer services like legal advice, like you as a tenant can have your contract reviewed by them for you to be sure that it's by law. And if the the landlord is trying to push you out, they will support you in court so that you don't lo lose your rights. And and they do it well. Okay, and they are. Not very big, but they do it in a, in a good way and, and in, a, in, a, in an effective way. Uh, in fact, the, 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 this new existence of uh, one uh, um, tenants association in, in, in Barcelona and in Spain is a very important novelty and is very necessary, this, this kind of agent. I think in our case is understandable that this kind of uh, irregularity that this, this doesn't exist until now. Uh, th there are different ex explanations, perhaps. One is the, the, this uh, uh, not stability in, in our housing market, the, the pass from a paternalist situation to a, a very strong speculating situation. This. Uh, the, 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 st the short time that people remain in, in, in the houses uh, as, as, a, as a tenants, even the laws, now the, in, uh, laws are against uh, tenants, uh, defending the interest of inversors, banks, and uh, so on. And, but I think the, the existence of this uh, syndic syndicate uh, the Yugates in Barcelona that, that is uh, following uh, the rest of Spain is a, a, another thing that w we are changing the mentality and we are, we are trying to recuperate the delay. Uh, even uh, I was in Buenos Aires one month ago and even in Buenos Aires there is an Asociación Civil de Inquilinos that have a, a hard power to, uh, to, to renew, renew laws. Well, uh, I think this is a very important uh, sign of our delay, the necessity of this uh, trade union of tenants that had been created very recently. But also it's a good thing because it means that people are trying to be organized. In other countries, there are 
uh, tenants from public uh, housing, organized tenants from a private ma market. Another step will be nearly that people living in public housing that are organized, have laws and, and protocols. Well, I, I think it's, it's very representative, that, that fact, no? And uh, 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 association of tenants is a very important agent in, in, the, in our scenery. Just to add something positive, in Lisbon, the, the, the social housing tenants organization it is very, very strong. They are part of all co-governance structures that, that are established in the, in the districts running public money in, in, in partnerships with the public authorities and even empowered and some projects are run by, the, by themselves. Uh, but, but the point is, in Lisbon, the legal, well, the, 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 the tenants' organizations of the social housing are strong enough to, to, to shift an election from one side to the other because they, they basically represent 20% of the population and they are very, very strong. And we've been empowering them as much as possible and delegating powers that used to be public for them with the transfers of money for them to be responsible for that so that they are really strong. So that just doesn't exist in the private sector. And to be very honest, the private tenants representatives are, are growing by being part of the same organizations as the, the, the social housing tenants organization. So, and that there's even a whole federation where the, whole, the huge majority comes from social housing. Thank you. Um, we don't have much time left, so I'll, I'll put together the last two questions. We have talked a lot about who should be uh, working in defining the, the, rain ceiling, the rain ceilings and why. Maybe, uh, of course, we understand that these rain ceilings, that the, these rain, la rain limits should uh, be part of a social agreement, of a, of a wider social agreement, not only as a, understood as a, as a thing of a property rights, etc. But maybe the question should be, who shouldn't be in there, right? Because we can see that there's a problem in terms of, 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 of some of its effects being seen only as a matter of some cities. So in the, in the long run of the state, some policies uh, do not apply, like in Spain, as Maria was explaining, all the public housing policy is about helping people to buy their house, which doesn't apply to Barcelona at all. But in any case, so who shouldn't be? And to 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 raise the the, the last questions, well, if we think in in a in a longer run, let's talk about the hopes. So, what what measures and actions should we have in maybe 20, 25 years, so we could be more or less sure that we are, have addressed the issue the issue of raising pressures on the housing markets that we are able to make sure that housing is for living in it, not for only investing or making money. Yeah, yes, you have its pain. The problem is that Madrid doesn't want to make a tenant's law. Uh, so that means I, my suggestion in Catalonia is uh, then you have to build uh, a own uh, yeah, housing organization to build houses and to buy houses for yourself. And we have to discuss with uh, Europe and uh, with the bank regulation that not uh, the, the buyer of these empty houses are not these international uh, trusts, but uh, your private Barcelona organization from the state. And you can perhaps make a discussion between landowners here that they build houses with these long-term possibilities of renting, you know. If you have not only this part-time renting, no, it's totally uninteresting to, to rent a house, you know. Only if you can say, okay, I, I go in this flat and then I can stay all my life there if I want, then it's interesting for you. So you have to change it totally and you can change it uh, in contracts, you know, that's, I think, my, my suggestion. And long time, I say, we are in a globalized economy and nobody can say, now you stay in, in your job in the next 20 years. So perhaps you have to um, go to Germany, <laughs> I don't hope, or you go to uh, Madrid or to another place. You know, this kind of property is not so 
secure anymore because if you are in a situation to to buy a house and you have to go to a bank and ask for a credit and if you have to sell it and you have not the price you get not the price of your of the price of your bought it then you have a big problem and so i think we are in a society which is more interested in renting a house it must be more interested in renting a house and to to give your money to another purpose you know and and not in housing because we are in a immobile world you know and um, or in a mobile world sorry in a mobile world and we have to change our places and so this kind of of uh, ownership is totally crazy and so you need other organization than this international funds who who build and buy houses um i'm just going to say kind of what i what i hope for the future in terms of the uk and in terms of london and i think what i very much hope is that the next uk government will take a really serious holistic look at reforming the rental market and my my personal view isn't the view of the mayor is that they should start with security of tenure so they should start with completely reforming the tenancy system in the uk so that we have that security um that they do in Germany and then I think at that point that's a much better starting point at which to look at what a sensible form of rent regulation would be in the UK um, which I'm sure we could then work towards but I think it it has to be that whole scale broad look at the whole market which has so many problems at present well uh, it's true uh, that, that you, you say when we came to Madrid to the Ministerio de Fomento, where ha housing is in, uh, is in, inside, uh, they say uh, is that this is the problem only for Barcelona, Ibiza, the tourist cities. is not, not It's not a problem for, for Spain, the increasing of prices, uh, the gentrification, and so on. This is true. Uh, another um, abnormality that we have in our country is doesn't exist any bank for housing, any bank hipotecario that, that doesn't exist even in, not in Catalonia, not in Spain. Now we are uh, building, uh, uh, constructing new buildings, new, ho new housing in Barcelona with European uh, uh, money. Uh, uh, that uh, explain also th this uh, kind of uh, special case in, in Spain. Uh, we hope that, and that means the, the future is in the cities, in me metropolitan areas. Uh, metropoli cities and metropolitan areas are the, 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 the scenery, the, the structure for the change, for the novelty, for, for the, 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 the rights. In this moment, uh, states, the, uh, all the states, the, uh, almost in Spain, are not useful to solve the problems. They, they are the problem for us. Uh, this is true, uh, and, the, the, and the, the cities are the solutions, the metropolitan areas are the solutions. We hope that as the uh, United Nations uh, ha has uh, promoted in 2030, the, the right of housing uh, will be solved around the world. It's not easy, we, we, we know it. And, uh, for, and to solve the problem around the world, in, in all the cities, the rent is the solution. The rent is the solution, the dignified the rent, uh, a regulation of the rent, and to create this uh, the shift from the property, property could be for, for some social classes, but f uh, for uh, the major part of people, the solution is a good fun 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 uh, working of the rent. So uh, I argue that the the rent cap, if it's a well, if if we do it again as we did in the past, like as a global universal measure, I th I believe that there's more disadvantages than advantages. On the other hand, I do believe that if we do, we define as we are trying to do in well, as we are doing in Lisbon, like different uh, uh, levels, different quotas with different systems, and then with imposed rules which are better for those who serve best the needs of the of the citizens and the city i think that that's way more balanced a, a, a good example of this on the balance between uh, long uh, lifelong contracts or six months contracts it is the new model that we are promoting now in lisbon which is it is a, a let's say a five year contract or a two year contract but that the the tenant if he comply with the rent it is automatically renovated and and the, and the landlord cannot kick him out. So the, the point is, the advantage 
of having a contract which is easy to, to solve if, if it's not complied, like if the rent is not paid, which is, which is the, the lowering of the risk that the landlord wants with the safety of the, of the, of the, of the tenant who pays, then he can stay there for the rest of, of his life with a limited rent progression, which in Portugal is, is indexed to the, to the inflation. So on, on the same contract, contract, the rent can only be, up, can, can only be updated uh, uh, with, a, with the level of inflation of the previous year. That's our rent cap. Okay? So you cannot speculate with the, with the rent raise because it's, it's indexed to the national uh, 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 in, in inflation for the duration of the contract. For as long as your contract is so uh, is signed, what I'm saying is like what we are changing now to put to get more landlords to put their houses on the market to rent is to say well if you because well the risk is that in Portugal if you don't pay the rent it will typically take too long for the landlord to to get his house back. So, but if if the contract if it is about the reno, automatic renovation of a contract, if you can prove you've been paying, that is gets the best of the two worlds for both the tenants and both the, the, the owners. But uh, uh, again, on what do I feel that we need to change is that there's a mismatch between our like local administration perception on how the market works or it doesn't work against the, the, the European treaty. At the European level, we understand housing market as a pure market, so as a service of, of general economic interest, which is not true. We all, we all have been saying the same here. So I need, I, I'm absolutely sure, convinced that we need to change this and to bring down the, the, uh, the treaties and the, and, the regu and the European regulation and even the funding allowances, funding and financing allowances, to the reality that, that we manage uh, in the cities, which is, which is clearly different. And that's what I, uh, that, that's our, I think that's our priority for the next five, ten years is, is to, uh, to close the bridge between reality in urban spaces and, and European regulation. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's time to finish. Uh, first, I'd like to thank all the audience for coming. Uh, it's been really cold, so uh, you, you've been resisting a lot. And second, I want to thank very much our speakers. Thank you very much for your experience and inspiration. And we hope to see you again and learn from you. Thank you very much. A big applause for them, please.